All right, thanks everyone for bearing with us through a few technical difficulties, but I'm excited to welcome you here for Maximizing Data Leverage at Vendor with DBT, HighTouch, and Metaplane. Our presenters today are Eric Edelman, the head of BI and AE at Vendor, and Kevin Hu, the CEO at Metaplane. You can follow along uh, with the presentation in Coalesce Maximizing Data Leverage uh, on the DBT Slack. If you haven't joined DBT Community Slack yet, why not? It's super easy, community.getdbt.com. You can join right now. Without further ado, Eric, Kevin, take it away. Thank you, Ben. Thanks for the intro, and thank you to all the stragglers for uh, you know delaying the flight so that you can stay for this talk. Uh, but I'm Kevin. I'm the CEO of Metaplane, and I'm really excited and really grateful to be sharing the stage with a good friend and a partner and someone who every time we talk, which is not often enough, I learn a whole lot from, especially when it comes to being deliberate on how to build data teams and specifically on how to build data teams in rapidly scaling companies. We had this conversation about a year ago, and this is you know, really sprouting from a dinner table conversation where it's like, okay, you know, how many employees does a vendor have? You know, 50, we chat a few months later. How many employees does a vendor have? Like 200? And then suddenly it was like around 400 today, and I was like, how big is your data team? It's five people, how the heck do you do that? Um, and it boiled down to three principles that Eric is going to present really nicely. So this talk, you can think of it, it's going to be a quick talk. Uh, Eric is the, the, the main actor today, and it's going to be three sliders with two slices of cheese in between. And those uh, two slices of cheese are two demos, uh, one on using high touch to activate customer touch points, and one on Metaplane. And I swear I won't be too vendory on that. But without further ado, I'll pass off the mic. Awesome. Thank you, Kevin. Um, very generous intro. Uh, you're going to make everyone disappointed when they actually meet me and discovered what I'm, what I'm really like. Um, anyway, let's get started, So, uh, especially because we're short on time. First, we're going to describe our problem. Then we'll get into those three principles um, one by one with those demo slices of cheese in between. All right. So um, what's our problem? It's scaling your data team with your company, right? So why do, you know, kind of the question here is, why do some data teams at growing companies go from being happy to being sad? Um, and why then is seeking leverage important? It's important because organizations that grow sometimes grow really, really fast, and their needs grow along with them, right? And so, you know, kind of before we move forward, what is leverage? It's just doing more with less. That's it. Really simple concept. This is more of a, a talk about team than it is about tech. Um, but anyway, so in my own career, I've, I've kind of experienced both the pain points and the potential solutions for this. Uh, in my own career, I've worked at WeWork during a period in which they grew from 250 to 10,000 employees. It was not all healthy growth, as I'm sure you're all acutely aware from the news and stuff. Um, that's actually a real photo from their legendary summer camp. Uh, a lot of very important work was done that day, I assure you. Um, I've. Uh, also been a consultant, and in consulting, if any of you are consultants, you, should, you would know that you face a lot of different new and interesting problems. You get to le learn from a ton of different um, awesome, interesting clients and people. And uh, the things that I've taken from all those experiences are kind of two, two main points here. So one is this problem of scale. Uh, I saw that purely throwing people and money at problems like WeWork attempted to do is not usually helpful in data. The other is that I developed a theory that investing in leverage and efficiencies for your team before you think you need to can be immensely worthwhile. Kevin is so good at this. Um, all right, so then at Vendor, I had the opportunity to uh, really test this theory out, to show that it could be done and to prove that with the right blend of people, tools, and methodologies, you could scale an organization without needing to also linearly scale your data team with it. You know, when we, you know, scaled, uh, uh, we work. We didn't go from that that same ratio, like 250 to 10,000, in terms of the data team size. We tried to, but it was extremely painful. Um, so I, then at Vendor, so I began as its 30th employee and as a data team of one. There are probably people in this room who've been in that position. It's both really exciting and also kind of scary sometimes. What I inherited were just the very beginnings of a DBT project, um, a Heroku Postgres warehouse and uh, just open, just like self-hosted Metabase for, for BI. So pretty light environment. 
But even then, Vendor had really big plans. We wanted to grow our customer base, product offering, and headcount immensely over the coming two years. And I knew from my previous experiences at high-growth companies what that could mean. It would necessarily mean an explosion in data requests, things like dashboards, reports, alerts, things of that nature. It would also mean significant increases in the complexity of those requests, right? Because as our product developed, as our business changed, as our team grew, uh, the problems we'd be solving would be trickier. They'd be stickier and they'd be harder. Then finally, um, it would also mean that we'd have a more complex environment of stakeholders to serve and to empathize with and to listen to. So things were changing. I asked myself at the beginning, what would my team look like in two years when we planned to have and did end up having a much bigger business with over 350 employees? Would my team be struggling to scale? Would we be a dozen burnt out analysts with no plan for the future? Or would we stay lean and stay sane and find leverage? So before I tell you the end of that story, we're gonna go through the three principles that we leaned on to uh, you know, help us have a better outcome for that story. And there'll be those demos along the way that we think exhibit a few of those uh, principles respectively. So the first of our three, uh, three principles I wanna go over is pretty common sense, and it's probably a big part of why many of us are here at Coalesce. It's just don't reinvent the wheel. What do we mean by that? So not reinventing the wheel, to us, kind of the biggest factor is just using best in class uh, technologies, right? So the modern data landscape, modern data stack landscape rather today really helps us do this. I mean, we're kind of spoiled these days, I think, in data compared to, you know, our, our, our forebears. Like, people used to have a much harder time getting data in and out of the warehouse, for example. So we have to take advantage of that. Um, I'll run us through some, uh, some things that, you know, like we, we like to say, help us uh, achieve this, this state where the computers get to do the jobs that the computers are good at, and we save the humans for the jobs that only we can do, like modeling our own unique, complex business logic. Um, so some of the elements of our stack that really help us save time, you've seen these before, DBT Cloud, we wanted our team to focus on modeling and not on managing their environment or orchestrating jobs. Next, high touch. Um, we, why would you build data activation pipelines and uh, audience builders that have already been built? No, you know, who wants to keep track of HubSpot's APIs, right? Probably nobody, except for apparently high touch, so that's good for the rest of us. Um, ELT, right? So these are, this is kind of like the OG crowd of the modern data stack, like Bytran. Uh, why wouldn't you, right? Why would you want to rebuild a pipeline that's been built to get data into your warehouse? We also, as a side note, think that people should be more comfortable using more than one of these providers where necessary. It's not hard to do more than one and then kind of like rectify any any discrepancies once you get to DBT. Separate topic though, separate talk. Um, finally, observability with Metaplane. For us, the question that Metaplane helps answer is like, why not accelerate the team when detecting schema changes upstream or detecting data anomalies or evaluating uh, lineage or usage in the warehouse? So these to us are totally no-brainers. Um, with these tools and technologies, we save our team a ton of time and we avoid reinventing the wheel. So that is our first principle of leverage. The second principle of leverage we wanna go into is save time for innovation. This one is a lot harder to remember and also a lot harder to put into practice. So forgive me uh, in advance for the tip that is extremely difficult. But what does this mean? Uh, how do we do less? Uh, to me, this ultimately, ultimately comes down to protecting your team's time. I personally consider this to be perhaps the most part of, uh, important part of my job at Vendor, protecting my team's time. Um, as hard as it can be to prioritize and implement, the solution we came up with was actually really, really simple. And this is definitely more directional than it is precise. It's more of an art than it is a science. But we came up with this thing called 60-20-20 time. And so roughly 20% of our time is budgeted for hygiene and tech debt, another 20% for innovation, and then the remaining 60% for like what we call our day job, right? The things we have to do all the time, like that BI projects, requests, you know, so on and so forth. What do those 20% really mean? Well, the first 20%, you're probably all familiar with that. It's like uh, basically cleaning up unused dashboards, tables, uh, refactoring models that are kind of outdated, things like that. Uh, the, the interesting 20% here is innovation. So for us, uh, this means a few different things. The, the most obvious ones are strategic improvements to our stack or our workflows. And so on, you know, respectively, like the first, 
that's getting a tool that you think is going to uh, sh shortcut your team and, and basically be a, a, a multiplier for your, for your time, um, or basically be a zero to a one in terms of a certain capability. Uh, another piece of that is, you know, you can optimize workflows, right, or processes. For us, we spent a lot of time thinking about how we triage and intake requests from the rest of the business. And we did that before we were 350 people, and we're very glad we did that, because now it's like a deluge, um, and we actually keep up. We more than keep up, for now. Um, but yeah, so that's kind of what innovation is, except there's one kind of X factor that we also like to include here, which is like hackathon style projects or kind of elective projects, because you never know where those are gonna lead. So you wanna save, you wanna, those are kind of included in this bucket of 20% time. But what's the end result here? So the end result, for us at least, was that that 60% of normal, uh, like quote unquote normal time, becomes less cumbersome and less burdensome because of the other 40, right? That investment in, the, in those, those first 40 makes the remaining 60 less painful. Another added benefit for us, um, we, we say that your team will be happier because this will add variety to, to, to your day and reduce frustration and overwork. So kind of in, in summary for this, for this principle, by protecting your team's time and saving time for innovation, your team is both happier and more effective. That is, that is principle number two, maybe my favorite one. Okay, so getting ready for demo time. Um, I think we might need to switch over. It might get a little glitchy, so I'm gonna go fast through the demo, because apparently my computer hates to display. But um, to kind of preface it a little bit, I'll just talk through this. But anyway, Kevin will work on this. <laughs> um, the story is that at Vendor, you know, we're a pretty service-heavy company. We have a lot of people who direct, like, interact directly with customers. And uh, our CS team, our customer success team, was spending hours and hours and hours a week uh, basically constructing and sending manually hundreds and thousands of emails and Slack messages uh, to our customers that were completely predictable um, through, through a customer event, right? So we were like, wow, this is just ripe for automation. And they had asked product and engineering if they could look into this. It never got to the top of the roadmap. It never became a priority, so enter the data team. We decided to uh, step in and, and really use kind of the first two principles here to, to make some magic um, using our, our best-in-class technologies and our, uh, and our innovation time we were able to actually make a huge difference for our CS team and avoid some unnecessary work from, from product, uh, product and engineering. So I'll breeze through this so nobody has a you know, seizure or something. Um, Sorry about that. Yeah, <laughs> but uh, a, few, a few things to, to cover here. So first, this is high touch. Um, this is a high touch sync. A couple things to highlight here. One is that um, we're taking advantage of, are we? Yes, we, we should be. There we are. Yeah, we are taking advantage of uh, High Touch's integration with DBT here. So this sync triggers off of the completion of a DBT job. That's just a magnificent little relationship that like, if you're using High Touch and DBT, you have to take advantage of. What is this actually doing though? So um, to kind of like rewind for a second, what, what's our goal here? We need to remind our customers that they need to submit an intake form for us to broker a deal for them, to save them time and money. So a lot of things go into that, and this, this kind of notification flow is opt-in or opt out, they're, they're defaulted in, but like they need to have some control in what they get and where they get it. Um, so we wanna give our CS team some flexibility there. So what we do here is we actually seed this Airtable with customer keys and, uh, and names, and then give the CS team basically this interface through which to enrich these customer records and say, subscribe, unsubscribe, make sure you go to email after 45 days or switch to Slack. Here's a CC requirement, things like that. So it's kind of an interactive flow because of that, and it's like, Super lean, right? We didn't have to borrow engineering time for this. It's just Airtable. You guessed it, we five tran the Airtable data back into Snowflake. And then you guessed it, we model that data in DBT. So that data gets joined to a lot of the rest of our customer data to, um, the end goal here is really to construct a intended message payload. So we're basically saying like, hey, what's the message, let's build the message we wanna send to a customer just in time in DBT and then use high touch to kick it off to where it needs to go. So I'll show you that in a second. But what's interesting about this model, uh, just for, you know, we're, we're at the DBT conference, I'm gonna get a little bit detailed on it. Um, it's an incremental model, but it never actually increments. And the reason for that is we're actually using uh, the current timestamp as part of the primary key. And so what it does is it just always appends data and uh, never actually updates it. And that's, it's kind of interesting, for, it works really great for us because it generates a new batch of messages, but then it retains our log of history. So we always know what we sent to who and when. 
And of course, high touch comes back in. Uh, what we're doing finally is this is our, we have two different flows that happen in high touch um, for the email side and the Slack side, respectively. But what's cool about the Slack one, two really cool things about the Slack one. So, first, we're using a variable to, to determine the destination, the Slack channel that we're actually sending to. We keep track of the Slack channels that we share with our customers. So, we can just drop that in to that field in high touch and drop this message to exactly where it needs to go. Um, second, we're using liquid templating in the, the actual body of the message. We didn't even need to do use, use Slack block kit here. We're using plain text with liquid templating, really simple stuff, to construct a bespoke message for that customer. What does that message look like? So this is what a message looks like. This is a dummy one. So this is reminding me to renew DBT Cloud by, uh, by June 23rd. And it's uh, reminding my colleague Skylar to renew Snowflake by June 30th. And those are real links to the intake form specific to those deals that they need to submit for us to be able to actually broker these deals for them. This goes out just in time, every time, and never fails. It's pretty great. And our CS team doesn't have to do it anymore. So finally, you know, you think, OK, great, the data team did this cool thing. Now what? How do we make sure it doesn't fall over? So there's a variety of means through which we, we ensure that it, things don't fall over, but a big player here for us is Metaplane. And so here, this may not show you a ton, but, um, but this is actually a distribution test in Metaplane. And what it's doing is it's monitoring the distribution of the values of a critical column in a critical table that is a, that is a major part of this workflow. And so what will happen is if, let's say, some wild thing happens upstream or we make an erroneous change in DBT that creates a violent change to this distribution, we'll get notified right away. And we can look into it and address the matter before the next batch of messages goes out to customers. So you don't want your customers seeing the bad data. You want to intervene before it gets there. And Metaplane helps us do that. So let's go back to you. Thank you for bearing with us here. <laughs> Okay, so now that we made it through the demo um, and nobody bugged out, we are onto our third principle. So this is the final one. We're almost at the end here. Uh, our final one is make your own job easier. This is also fairly intuitive, but it's also really hard to actually do. It's, it's way easier said than done. Um, for us, there are a lot of things we try to do to make our own jobs easier because we're extremely lazy at Vendor, but the thing we're gonna highlight is, again, Metaplane. Um, are we on the right one? Yep, so for us, Metaplane does a number of things that make, makes our lives easier. So to start with, it's effectively a zero upfront investment that continually pays off. For us, we're less worried about anomalies in the warehouse in perpetuity because of the one day that we decided to sign up with Metaplane. That's huge. That's a great return on investment. Um, a couple of more detailed things that we absolutely love are staying on top of upstream schema changes. So everyone knows that software engineers are really good about telling the data team about every change they're making, right? Yeah, absolutely not. Turns out at Vendor, they're actually pretty good at it, but they don't get every single change. We use Metaplane to stay on top of every single change that happens upstream, and uh, we, we love it for that. That was actually our very first use case. Um, still saves our butts to this day. Uh, next, we actually catch production data issues with Metaplane. This is really cool for us, because we didn't expect it when we, when we first kind of got set up. Um, so there's a couple points in the deal lifecycle at Vendor for our customers where uh, there's a manual data input, right? One fun example is like a savings value at one point. Occasionally, we'll get a notification from Metaplane that says the new minimum for that value is negative quadrillion. And we're like, that's definitely not right. <laughs> we did not bankrupt our customer. Um, so then we'll you know, intervene and take this to the right people to make sure that gets remedied. Another hilarious one is like the deal close date. Once in a while, we'll get one that says like, hey, this deal closed in the Bronze Age. And we're like, that's definitely not right either. We can go fix it before it causes you know, further problems downstream. Uh, lastly, I'll just finish by saying, you know, what we just showed in that first demo is, at this point, a pretty like, important workflow for vendor. It's, it's not something we want to have fail. And for us, Metaplane provides the observability we need to feel comfortable taking on these high SLA projects. So we're very happy about that. So off to you, Kevin, for a little bit. I'm going to leave this here, if that's OK. Just in case, yeah. for sure. 
see if we can make this work. Great. Yeah, thank you, Eric. Yeah. Um, it's amazing. I, I learn something every time you speak. And even though we've gone through those slides like a dozen times together, I don't even know about some of those details, especially the bronze, the bronze Age one. Yeah. But I'll be super quick. Uh, this is a demo of Metaplane. I think Eric uh, pitched it better than I could. So I'll Venmo you the 20 later. Uh, and the reason I start from the landing page is because that's it. No, I'm just joking. There's a whole app behind it. But you can like sign in. Uh, in this case, I signed in with my personal Gmail account with an embarrassing name. And you've and there's really three steps to get started. Uh, one is to connect a data source like Snowflake, BigQuery, Redshift. Uh, you plug in everyone's favorite transformation tool uh, and plug in a BI tool. And every time you connect an application, we extract the lineage with every other application. So for example, Snowflake and Looker, we have the lineage between a Snowflake column with a LookML explore field to LookML dashboards. Why that's important will come out in a second. You connect an alerting destination like Slack or PagerDuty or email, and then you configure monitoring. And Metaplane provides a couple of things off the bat. Uh, usually the setup is less than 15 minutes. Uh, we have some customers that do it faster than I can, so I don't know, I mean, people here can be amazing sometimes. But one thing you get off the bat is the column level lineage. So on the left-hand side it are columns within a Snowflake instance. On the right-hand side are, for example, uh, mode reports. You have the famous schema changes uh, from upstream uh, engineering teams in here. And we also parse the query history from your data warehouse to help understand which tables are being used, uh, how often, and when to help you understand, okay, is there some cruft that we can get rid of during the famous 20% time? Uh, or is there anything that we can refactor because it's getting hit and this table is effectively costing us like 100K in credits? Uh, and the reason all of that is important is to help inform uh, data tests. So this is the page where you set up tests in Metaplane. On the left-hand side, you see information schema, database schema, table columns. You see the usage of all the tables. And the right-hand side are the different types of tests that you can create, uh, whether it's like something more foundational, like tracking the number of rows or the freshness of a table, or a test on a column, like tracking the cardinality of an enum, the uniqueness of a primary key, the distribution of the negative quadrillion uh, savings column. And our philosophy at Metaplane is that if it's not easy to add a test, then you will not have tests. So if you wanted to add a test, for example, on the cardinality of this name field, you wouldn't actually do that. But uh, you just click a button. And now, every hour, we retrieve that piece of metadata from your data warehouse. And we now have a historical record of how that value has changed over time. You can think of it almost like product analytics on your actual data itself. So for here, for an e-commerce customer, you see that the monthly retention table has 2.6 million rows and is plodding along monotonically until at 5.06 in the morning, it tanks to 200,000. And I see a lot of heads of data out there. And raise your hand if you've had an issue like this come up. All right. Uh, I'll demo you all 20 later, too. <laughs> no, the, so it, it, it tanks to 200,000. And we sent an alert to this customer, and they were able to fix it before anyone downstream was impacted. Here's another example of a freshness alert. So this orders table for an e-commerce customer is refreshed you know, roughly every hour or so uh, until it's been you know, it's midnight, and it's been three hours. It's uh, 8 AM, and it's been 12 hours. And this is no bueno. Uh, we sent them an alert containing the downstream dependencies. Uh, so that you can understand, well, one, OK, this is a real issue. But you know, my team is strapped for time. We're a high leverage team. We can't spend our time doing everything. Uh, so is this a real problem? OK, yes. Uh, and can I do anything about it? If the answer to all three of those things is yes, OK, then maybe I'll spend my time fixing this issue. And what our customers actually see is what we call an incident. Uh, this is uh, Metaplane's idea of a trace in Datadog or Splunk land, where data issues don't happen in isolation typically, but rather because you know, everything is a logical transformation of another piece of data or at the source, like a human put it in or a machine put it in because a human told it to, uh, that alerts tend to be related to each other. So you can think of an incident as a bundle of related alerts that we try and uh, group by the lineage, by the type of issue, and by the timing, 
we include all of the downstream impacted tables, we try and thin it out a little bit, and also upstream dependencies as well as upstream pull requests. And with that, I'll hand it back to you, Eric. All right. Okay, so we're pretty much wrapping up. Um, yeah, so basically to conclude the story that we started at the beginning, two years on, I'm happy to say that we did find enough leverage on my team to uh, stay lean and stay sane while the business experienced rapid growth around us. Uh, we did this by you know, adopting these three principles that, that we went over in this, in this session. Uh, in hindsight, we had two really interesting things that Kevin and I decided we just couldn't leave out of this talk. It might feel a little like incongruous here, but there were just really interesting takeaways that looking back on these two years, we thought we'd share. So one, um, and both are maybe a little bit surprising, but like the first is we determined that we're okay with a relatively high ratio of SaaS spend to salary spend on the data team. That might be a little bit surprising, but we look around and we see other teams with you know, a lower ratio, uh, both internally and externally, and we determined that on a, like on a broader basis, we're actually being relatively capital efficient. We have a small team that is like paid well, but uh, also leaning heavily on SaaS to scale themselves so that our team of five feels like a team of 15. That way we can address the needs of a 350 person company and growing. The second kind of surprising takeaway was that while we sought to provide ourselves with leverage, we ended up also providing uh, the organization with leverage. So what this really means is that, you know, if you get it right, the data team can take on workloads that might otherwise have been owned by other teams, thereby saving them their valuable time. And so that first demo was actually a pretty prime example of that. Not only were we directly saving CS time because they were no longer constructing these messages, we saved software engineers time because they had planned on potentially building out a flow for this themselves. So that was also like a net kind of add-on benefit that we really uh, realized comes with leverage. All right, so wrapping up, uh, in summary, leverage is the key to surviving at a high growth company while continuing to meet the needs of the organization. The way we think about this um, in terms of goals on my team at Vendor is that, yes, ostensibly the team's outward goal is to continue to serve the needs of the organization in terms of serving and you know, providing data. We, we more enable analytics than, than perform it, so that's kind of how we think about it. Um, we have partners who are analysts, but we also need to ensure that they're confident in the data. However, our internal goal may seem like a mismatch, but we've decided that it's really to just continue to seek leverage because we think that all the other things that we need to do, have to do, and want to do follow from that. So we're gonna continue doing you know, what we've been doing at Vendor, continue to work with these three uh, principles to you know, kind of be the best team that we can be. And that pretty much wraps it up. So yeah, thank you all for being here. We really appreciate it. Shout out to the online folks. And uh, we actually, I think, have some time for questions. We are a couple minutes over, but oh, okay. that's mind. okay. We had tech issues. <laughs> we'll at do the it beginning. on Slack. So yeah, um, yeah. let's have a round of applause.